I invite you to open up the Word of God, turn to Mark chapter 4. We continue our series through the book of Mark that we have called the Unserved King. And we do so because of Jesus' words, or we've done so because of Jesus' words, that He is a King who did not come to be served, but to serve and give His life as a ransom for many. And we want to know this King more. We want to be served by the unserved King. And uh, we've been served in the gospel that we have been singing today. I hope, even as we finish the last song, that your hearts are delighting in the goodness of God in Jesus Christ. God is so good to us. Could have left us alone in our sin, lost in darkness and despair. And yet to rescue us, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ. He gave His life to redeem us from sin. And that's why we gather around His Word. We're going to look at verses 21 through uh, 34 during our time together. Uh, However, for the sake of time, I'm going to... Uh, read verses 23 through 25 as we stand in reverence to the reading of God's perfect word. Hear the word of Christ. And as you hear these words, apply them. Let them sink in. And with humility receive the implanted word of Christ today. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. For the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Oh God, many of us gather here today and we have Bibles in our hands. We have them on our phones and on our devices. And yet we don't have ears to hear. And what we have, you say, your very words, what we have, if we do not hear them, will be taken away from us. God, and we do not want to be a church where your word is removed. And we want to be a church that is open and full, ready to receive the full measure of your word, the light of the kingdom, the gospel, and even more. God, I pray that we would do so according to your word and by the power of your spirit today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The word plod. I think it's one of my favorite words. P-L-O-D. I know it's my favorite word in describing ministry. If you're around me much, you know that I say that. We just got to keep plodding. Let's just plod. I say it quite often. And this word first grabbed my attention in a quote by William Carey, who is the father of modern missions. He lived from 1761 to 1834. And at one point, William Carey, he was saying, if you want to describe my life at the end of my life, if you want to give me credit for anything, here's what you should say about me. I can plod. I can persevere in any definite pursuit To this, I owe everything. Now, William Carey was someone who had to plod. He was born into poverty. He was poorly educated. He apprenticed as a shoemaker, but was a really, really bad shoemaker. He wasn't successful at that occupation. He started a school at one time, but he ran it very poorly. And when he was first called to preach, his sermons were so tedious and boring that he was denied ordination on his first try. And then when Kerry got to India, after being there seven whole years, 
He looked around and no one had believed the gospel. There were no converts. He eventually translated the Bible into Bengali and five other languages. Portions of the Bible he translated into 29 different languages. But then at one stage in his translation work, he lost 10 years of work to a fire. He's epitome of a plotter. What it means to plot. You just keep working no matter what. You just keep after it. The father of modern missions. And throughout ministry, I've I've taken great pride in saying I can do that. I may not be that smart. I may not be that creative. But I can plot. I can just work and I can just keep at something. That's I take great pride in that. However... I I was realizing in our context, the word plod, plotting, to be a plotter, is actually a very unappealing word in our modern context, in the way we think about the word. And so I began yesterday just looking up definitions of what it means to plod, plotting. As an adjective, the word means to be slow moving and unexciting. Thorough and hardworking, but lacking imagination and intelligence. So I realized my whole ministry, I've been saying, I can plod. I'm a plotter. I'm slow and unintelligent. As a verb, it means to walk doggedly and slowly with heavy steps. Or to work slowly, persevering at a dull task. So a plotter unintelligent, who's working at a very dull task. Now, shouldn't ministry be described as something more exciting? Should we uh, refer to the father of modern day missions as a plotter when the uh, the word carries such unappealing connotations? Heavy steps, doggedly, dull task. Shouldn't, as we talk about missions today, shouldn't we use words that are a little more exciting, a little more adventurous? Shouldn't we describe it in great ways? Well, something else that's interesting about William Carey is he's also known for a very famous quote, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. So the plotter, that was sort of his motto. And we may ask today, how can you attempt great things at God for God? How can you expect great things from God if you're just a plotter? If you're just plotting. And, and here's the problem. In our modern day context, and even when we think about ministry and we think about church, we think great things for God are done in very fast ways. Immediate ways. In very Big and impressive ways. And if you're not doing things in these great, fast, impressive, great, immediate ways, then you must not be doing anything great, especially for God. And yet Jesus teaches us something totally different in the section we're going to look at today. He teaches us in this section that great things are seen and done by plotting. And great things are not always fast. Most often they're slow. And great things are not always impressive. A lot of times they're hidden. And you don't see them immediately. It takes a long time. This is how Jesus describes the kingdom beginning in verse 21. He said to them, is the lamp. Now in your English translation, it's going to say a lamp. I don't know why it does that. In the original, it's the lamp. Is the lamp brought in to be put under a basket? Now, this is a measuring basket. You think of a bushel. It was a nine liter basket that held grain. And so do you bring the lamp of the house in to put it under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? And we know the answer to that question. You're going to light up your house. During this time, this is how they lit up their house at night with a lamp. You bring the lamp in, you put it on a stand so you can see everything. You don't bring it in and dump out your grain basket and put the basket on top of the lamp. And you don't just hide it under the bed. No, you put it out so you can see everything. 
Look at verse 21. He says, for nothing is hidden except to be manifest. The lamp comes in to show what is hidden. So you see it clearly. Nor is anything secret except to come to light. Well, the goal of the lamp is to display what you can't see, what is a mystery in the dark. And then he says, verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, remember last week as Jesus is talking about his ministry of parables. And to tell a parable, uh, we understand Jesus is throwing a story, an illustration alongside of the kingdom to explain what the kingdom looks like. And here he says, the lamp, which is the kingdom, the kingdom comes into the world to show us what we don't see, to make manifest what is hidden without the kingdom. And the kingdom is not to be hidden. No, it has a purpose. It is to be displayed. Now, we've seen the essence of the kingdom in Jesus's message. The kingdom is at hand in my flesh and blood. And as he casts out demons, as he heals the sick, as he controls nature that's out of control, as he does all of these things, he's saying the kingdom is at hand. The light is at hand. That which will make all things make sense one day, that Jesus is king, is at hand. And this truth that Jesus is king is the light he's unveiling in a world darkened to God by Satan's sin and death. What Jesus is teaching in his flesh is what we read in Colossians chapter 1. All things are made to and through and from and by Christ. God's goal for the cosmos is that Jesus would be king. That is the light. And that is the light that's going to make sense out of all of your life. And you can't take that truth and hide it and know where you're going. You can't take the truth that Jesus is king and look around the world and make sense of it. It is the light that must be displayed for you to know who you are and where you're going. If you wake up every day and say, I'm king, then you're living in darkness. You will be lost. You will be miserable. You will not know what's going on in the world around you. And so you wake up every day and you turn on the light. Jesus is king and I exist for his glory. Now, it's foolish to take that light and hide it and not live by it. And it's foolish to only try to live by that light every Sunday. Because that's what some of us are doing here today. We show up every Sunday and remind ourselves Jesus is king. We sing songs about him being king. We gather with other people who say we're a part of his kingdom. And we gather around that light one day a week. And then we try to live the rest of our life without that light, according to our own wisdom, as if we're king. And we're like a guy walking through a dark woods with a little flashlight, and he turns it on every seven steps. And what ends up with that? Where does he end up? Falling in holes, running into trees, off the path, and eventually over a cliff. Now, we live all of life by the light Jesus is King. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, defeated sin and Satan for me. And so I live in light of that light. And that's what Jesus says. I'm coming in the world to bring that truth. You have to live by it. In verse 24, he said to them, again, pay attention now. Throughout this whole section, you can go back and you can underline where Jesus is saying, listen, pay attention. Be careful how you hear. It's like you're talking to your kid. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me right here. Look at me. That's what Jesus is doing. Why? Why does he have to tell us to look and pay attention? Because we don't tend to pay attention. So over and over in this section, there's a command Pay attention to what you hear. Listen to me. Then he says, with the measure you use. Now, there's a play on words here. We, we just heard about the basket, read about the basket, and now the measure. He's referring to the basket here. And he says, the way in which you use the basket, the measure, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. And then he says, verse 25, for the one who has more will be given. But the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now, Jesus is explaining something. He says, if you want the kingdom, 
Don't come to me with a little basket. Don't come with me thinking you can just get enough of the kingdom, what you want of the kingdom, and measure it out. No, you come with a basket ready to receive it all. You come ready to receive the whole kingdom. Because if you're coming to measure it out, you won't receive any of the kingdom. You can't pick and choose what parts of the kingdom you want. And there's a play on the words here with light. He says if you if you have this light under a basket and you're trying to measure out the light by which you live, that's not going to work. To see, you got to throw the basket off. You want all of the light. And so when we come to Jesus, that's how we come to Jesus. Not just I want some of Jesus, I want some of the gospel. Jesus, your Lord and your King, your ruler, I want it all. Selective faith is not saving faith. See, so often we try to measure out just enough of the gospel to get me into heaven. What Jesus is saying here is just enough of the gospel is not enough to get you into heaven. It's the whole gospel. Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord. He died for your sins. He's ruling. He's reigning. He's defeated death for you. He is Lord. He is King who will rule forever. Not just adhering to some thoughts about Jesus. Not just doing enough. You see, there were many that were coming to Jesus that were in awe of his miracles. Think about the crowds we've talked about. They, they loved Jesus as a teacher. And they wanted just enough of Jesus. And when, I'm sure when he talked about kingdom, they thought overthrowing the Romans. I'm sure as he talked about eternity, they were like, yes, that's what we want. We'd be happy forever. But when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me because we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. They all turned away. They all left him. They thought they could just get enough. He says, no, you can't measure out the kingdom. The kingdom is me and you have to believe in me. Selective faith is not genuine faith. Many people show up and they say, I like the Jesus that shares. Shares his fish, shares his bread. Love that story. Kids love it. Veggie tails, tomatoes, and cucumbers tell that story. It's so nice and sweet. But I hate the Jesus when he confronts me on my idol of money. I don't want any part of Jesus. He's going to do that. I like the Jesus who eats with sinners, talks about forgiveness, but I reject the Jesus who talks about hell. And if you're rejecting any part of Jesus, you're rejecting Jesus. You're trying to hide the light and you're not seeing everything. You're not seeing the whole room. And it's the monsters over in the corner that end up eating us that we don't see when we try to control the light. No, it's the whole light. It's the whole gospel. We believe in the whole Jesus. We trust in a person and everything he would call us to do, everything he would say we should believe. A couple of years ago, I don't know if you remember the solar eclipse, when the world just stopped because of the a solar eclipse. I know it was a cool thing, and we canceled school and purchased plastic glasses and put welding helmets on our cats and dogs. Because they don't know not to look at the sun. But one of the coolest moments during the solar eclipse was, if you remember when the moon began to block the sun and you could look down on the ground and you could see little half moons everywhere and then they sort of converged on each other and you were like, wow, this was worth not going to school today. This, was all, this is awesome. You're under trees, you see little half moons everywhere. If you want to know where you're eclipsing the light of the gospel in your life, look down at the shadows. Because what you're going to see is little shadows of yourself everywhere. Because you're the one standing in the light of the gospel, in the way of the word of God from shining in your life. You see, the truth again, we go back to it. Jesus is king. Jesus is ruler. And where in your life are you standing in the way of that truth? Is it in your marriage? Say, I, I believe in Jesus to get to heaven, but I don't want Jesus shining his light in my marriage. Because marriage is about me. Marriage is about getting what I want. 
my desires, my expectations. And if Jesus shines his light in my marriage, he's going to call me to love the way he loves. He's going to call me to follow and trust and obey, not obey, respect, submit. Obey him is what I meant to say. He's going to call me to do those things. I don't want to do those things. Look down and see where you see the shadows of yourself. That's where you're trying to block the light of the gospel. I want what I want in that area. I I don't want to trust my husband. I want what I want. I, I don't want to love my wife as Christ loved the church. I want to get what I want out of this situation. And all across your marriage, you're seeing little shadows of yourself. Think about your friendships. Some of us just want friends who agree with us all the time. We want to use them for what we want to make us feel special. And yet if Jesus shines his light into our friendships, you're going to find friends that are going to tell you some things you don't want to hear. You're going to find friends who love you enough to tell you the truth, but you want to get in the way of that. Look in your friendships. Do you see little shadows of yourself? Think about the gospel itself. The the gospel is about Jesus being king, Lord, and Savior, ruler. It's his righteousness. It's his death. It's his life that saves you. And some of us want to get in the way of that light. We say, no, I want to be my Savior. I, I think I'm righteous enough. And you're blocking the light of the gospel in your life. And you can see these shadows all around. The question is, where do you see yourself and not the glory of Christ? You see, Jesus is is God's light into the world. The gospel is the light that Jesus is Savior King. And Jesus will not live in your shadow. He won't. And you will only block that light for some time. Now, the light of the gospel is meant to be seen and displayed. And we're to throw the basket off. And we're to say, God, I don't want to see any of me. I want to see all of the glory of Christ. And what that means is we come before the word of God and we say, teach me, show me how I can display your glory and not my glory in marriage and friendship. Show me how I can display your glory in my life. I don't want to see any speckled shadows of me. I don't see any images of me. Show me when we submit to his word. We don't try to measure it out. Notice verse 26. And he said, the kingdom is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. And again, we talked about this last week. The sower goes out and he throws out seed. And the kingdom of God is this word. Jesus is king and is being sown in the word. The kingdom is at hand in his person, in his work. And this is being sown all over the earth. He says, this is how the kingdom works. It's like a man goes out and he sows these things and then he goes to sleep and he rises night and day. He does this for some period of time. And then all of a sudden, the seed sprouts and grows. And he knows not how. Now he knows how. He just didn't sit down and watch it happen. He threw it out. He worked. Eventually it happened. Notice verse 28. The earth produces by itself First, the blade, then the ear, then the full grain. All of the parts of the grain begin to develop in their own time. And you don't sit down and you don't watch these things. Stages of development. When you're sowing seed. Any of you farmers know this? You worked in corn or tobacco. You know, you just throw the seed out. And then one day you're driving by the field and you say, oh, I think I see something out there. Then each day, each week, but you don't just pull up a chair and watch it happen. You can't insta-story it. It happens over a long period of time. And it almost seemingly doesn't happen when you're watching it happen. And Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. In verse 29, when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle. He comes out with the sickle and he begins to cut it down because the harvest has come. Now, 
One of the most important things when we think about harvest in Jesus' teaching is it always refers to a time of judgment. We think about harvest. We, we think about times of when Jesus is bringing in the harvest, bringing in the good. But to bring in the harvest, you have to cut it down. And there's a time of judgment. To bring forth what is good, there must be judgment. And he says here, you're working in the field, you're plotting, you're sowing. And then all of a sudden you see the crop come forth. And all of a sudden there is the day of judgment. There is the day of harvest. This is the activity of the kingdom. It just doesn't happen immediately. Boom, there it is. It takes time, plotting. Most days you don't see anything happen. Jesus says that's the way the kingdom will be. We will sow the word and then over time, God will bring forth his people. But then all of a sudden you will show up one day and it's a time of judgment. And so one point here is to be patient. God is bringing the harvest about. Paul told the Corinthians that he sowed the seed, Apollos watered, but God brought the increase. And seeing God work in the world, seeing how the Word works in the world, isn't something where you just pull up a chair and you watch it happen like you're watching a movie. No, it's years. It's a process. All spiritual growth takes years of unnoticed work over periods of time. So what Jesus is calling us to is when you see the work of the kingdom, be patient. Think about Years, not moments. Think about long periods of time. Some good, some bad. This is how God works in the world. It's, it's like parenting. You wake up every day, and you parent as a parent. And it is a daily grind. And you don't get an award at the end of the day. You don't get a paycheck at the end of the day. You don't, you don't get any reward. It's not like you look back and if you're a parent, you look back and you go, wow, this was a really bad day of parenting. And most days are like that. And it's a grind and you're working and you're plotting. And then all of a sudden they're grown folks. Like, wow, that happened very quickly. Poof. They're here. They're, they're grown. They're adults. He says, that's the way the work of the ministry looks like in the world. One of the things is parents... One, one reason we have to be patient with our kids, or we should be, one reason we shouldn't freak out is because the things we're teaching them so often took us years to learn, right? You ever get irritated with your kids? Like, why are you doing that? Why are you making that bad decision? Why'd you spill that milk? Why'd you wreck that car? Why'd you break that dish? Why'd you buy that stupid thing? And you step back and go, actually, it took me a lot longer to learn those lessons than it's taken you. And that's one of the reasons you get so irritated. (laughs) is because you know how foolish those things are. But just like parenting, you have to be patient. There's going to be spilled milk, bad decisions, broken dishes, bad purchases, wrecked cards. Just chill out and keep plotting. Just chill out. This is so important in the life of the church because we want to be a part of something that's now. Everything is now and it's fast and it's immediate. And that's not the way the word works in the church. It takes years of plotting, of preaching, of sharing, of investing. And so often when we're we're sharing the word, we look at people and we say, why are you not believing We have to remember, it took me years to understand this. Why are you so shallow? Oh, it took me years to understand this doctrine. Why are you so selfish? Oh, it took me years to understand that the gospel carves out our selfishness. And we have to be patient. We have to stand back. And what do we do? We just keep plotting. We just keep praying. We just keep going. And sometimes it's like we're plowing concrete. We just keep plowing it. Because God will bring the increase in His time. You can't sit down and watch it. 
But the most important point here is God will not sleep on his judgment. If you look at God right now and you say, God, you must have gone to sleep. He says, no, 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 no. It's like a man who's sown the word and I will come back for the harvest and there will be time of judgment. We look at our world right now and some of us are really quick to say, God is judging us. God is judging us. And there may be some truth in that. But have you ever thought, no, maybe God's just plowing the ground up. Maybe he's just getting started with this thing. And maybe he's just softening the soil for the seed to penetrate. Maybe judgment's even further on out. This is not something you can sit down and watch. But it is something you should expect. And so for all of y'all saying God is judging us and we should all take that very seriously. When's the last time you shared the gospel with somebody? When's the last time you sowed the seed? If you really believe in the judgment of God, it's a lot worse than what you're seeing on CNN and Fox News. It is fire and it is torment. It is a sickle that comes in and raises everything to the ground. And then those who do not believe in Jesus will be tossed into the lake of fire forever. Do you believe that? Selective faith is not genuine faith. Jesus teaches us those very things. And if you believe those things, you will be sowing and you will be plotting and there will be friends in your life and you may be frustrated. They're not believing the gospel. But are you plotting? Are you praying? Are you sharing? Are you getting after it? Notice as we continue verse 30, he said to them, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use? He said it's like a grain of mustard seed. Which when it is sown in the ground is the smallest of seeds on the earth. Now, this, the mustard seed was not the smallest seed. This is a proverb of the time. Because the mustard seed was really small. But then verse 32, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants. Now that's the truth. You have this little bitty tiny seed. You sow it and it becomes this massive shrub in the middle of your garden. And puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. He, Jesus says this is what the kingdom is like. It's like this little insignificant seed that comes into the world and you don't even see it. And then all of a sudden it's this massive kingdom. And everybody flocks to it for rescue. He says that's what the kingdom looks like. The kingdom comes in small. It's insignificant. It's unnoticed at first. It's like a baby to a peasant girl born in a barn. A homeless, itinerant preacher teaching blasphemy. A weirdo who begins to lead people and they begin to follow him. And as soon as he makes headway, think about the life and ministry of Jesus when he goes to Jerusalem. People are like, we're about to take over. We're about to take this city over. Hosanna. Palm branches being thrown on the ground. As soon as we begin to think... Here is the kingdom, the tree he's talking about. It's going to grow. Jesus loses in a landslide at Golgotha. And he is killed as a common pickpocket criminal. And then his followers are a bunch of weirdos teaching conspiracy theories for 2,000 years. But look around. That little, insignificant, unnoticed Seed outside of Jerusalem is growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. And And you get to be a part of it. You get to flock to it for rescue. Imagine the people that showed up during the weekend when Jesus is crucified. They came in town just for the festivities. And they see this criminal crucified by the Roman government as just part of the ceremonies, as just part of the festivities. And they went back home and never thought anything about it. The Roman soldier who nailed him to the cross went home that night and maybe put his kids in the bed. It's just, wasn't anything massive happening in human history? And yet God was planting his seed in the world. And what we do here today is we grab the plow and we get to plotting with the truth that that man was king. That man is Lord. 
And we grab our little corner of the field here in Richmond and we, we go to Ica and we go to New Orleans and we go around the world and we just plod and we plod and we plod and we plod and people look at what we're doing and they're not going, wow. Those people, you know, you could compare that church to Apple. They're doing great, ingenious things over there at Ashland. No, we're just plotting. Because that's the way God works. And one day, we will look up in the New Jerusalem, and our plotting here, we will look around at a massive tree that we have flocked to for salvation. And that's what you're a part of. I hope you're okay with that. You're not going to have news crews here Sunday after Sunday. People aren't just fascinated with your TikToks at BFG. They, we, we're not all influencers. And yet we are sowing the most important thing that you have ever known that will grow into this amazing thing. But it takes time. Notice verse 33. With many such parables, he spoke to them. And this is just a list of parables. I want to tell you what the kingdom is like. It's like this. And then Jesus does this thing, and it doesn't really make sense to us. He says, with parables, just these stories, he spoke to them. Notice he says, as they were able to hear it. As they were able to hear it. As his disciples began to get it. That's the kingdom. He's talking about the kingdom. Oh, he's talking about someone going fishing. He's talking about someone going to the wedding. He's talking about someone sowing seed. He's talking about, oh, he's talking about the kingdom. Let's listen. But notice there's others standing around as he's talking to his disciples. He did not speak to them without a parable. And so they're kind of left in the dark. But privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Why would he do this? Why would he pull his disciples aside and explain to them everything and not the crowds? Why would you see Jesus talk about these things and then pull his disciples over and say, Okay, guys, I'm going to describe to you and explain to you what I'm talking about. Well, what you're seeing here is the harvest. It's judgment. For those who rejected Jesus, for those who tried to measure Jesus out, they did not respond to the light. Jesus judged them by taking his word away from them. Isn't that scary? That is frightening. Have you ever seen that in your own life? You ever seen those friends, those family members who you share the gospel with, share the gospel with, share the gospel with? They grow up in church, grow up in church. They're at the youth camp. They're there, they're there, they're there. And you look at them and you realize they don't care about Jesus. They're not getting it. They're not receiving the word. They're not repenting of their sin. And then all of a sudden, they're not there. That's not that Jesus is boring, by the way. That's not that the kingdom is irrelevant, by the way. That's Jesus' judgment. And it should scare you to death if you're here today and you're rejecting the gospel because you may not be back next week. And you may not open that Bible again. Think about all of the people, the crowds, the priests who are rejecting Jesus, the scribes, the Pharisees. And here what Jesus finally does is He just takes the Word of God away from them. He just takes the kingdom away from them. If you came in here today and you're yawning at this and, oh, I was here for a quick fix, the sort of things you're talking about kind of makes life harder and you sort of yawn and you move on. Again, that's not that this is boring. The kingdom, the word of God is boring. That could be God's judgment. But notice the disciples, when they respond, they're given the kingdom and more. In in the picture here, the disciples are those who come with the basket, the big basket. Give us everything, Jesus. Tell us it. Tell us all. Everything. Give us all the light. We're not going to hide it. Tell us. Tell us. Tell us. And it seems as though every time they respond to the Word of God, Jesus opens up even more and tells them even more. Do you experience that in your life? You won't experience that if you're not in the Word of God. One of the things that 
genuine believers experience when they began reading the Bible is they want more, they want more, they want more, they want more. And the Spirit begins to open up the Word of God to them. And so keep plotting, keep reading the Word of God. The kingdom begins to get bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter in your life. Keep doing it. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, no, that's not me. Start with a verse a week. Just read something. And if you pursue the kingdom, the kingdom will be opened, given by faith, trust, repentance in Christ. Pat Summit, some of you know her, the great one of the greatest coaches who's ever lived. I'm not just saying that because I'm a Tennessee fan. But she was the Lady Vols basketball coach, won eight national championships. When she was dying of Alzheimer's, someone asked her how she was dealing with it. And the reporter wrote, she's dealing with it the same way she told all of her teams to practice and play and live. Her quote was, left foot, right foot, breathe. That's how I'm dealing with it. Left foot, right foot, breathe. And this is what she taught her teams. She she would teach them You don't see eight national championships in the next step. You don't see all of the wins in the next breath. But that's what you're called to do in the moment. Is take the next step. Breathe the next breath. And sometimes that's all you got. Is to plod. Apply the word in this moment. Apply it in the next. Trust Jesus right here. Trust him again. Believe him again. Believe him again. Cling to the gospel in this step. Breathe. And that's what life looks like. You don't see the end in the step. You trust him in the step. You step into the light that's in front of you. I was thinking about that this week with just all of the things that are going on in our culture. The confusion, the conspiracies, the opinions, the predictions, the polls, all of the information that just gets so confusing. And I thought about this. What if I just did what I know to do? And I quit worrying about who's right, who's wrong, what this, that, that. I have enough truth in the Word of God to consume the rest of my life and never pick up social media again. I have enough light in the Bible, the full revelation of Christ, to consume my time. I don't have to worry about those other things. Isn't, I, even if I do know all the ins and outs of all of that, what difference does it make? Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord. And He's called me to take another step trusting Him. And what if I just did that? What if we just gave ourselves over to what we know is absolutely true and quit worrying about the other things? I thought about a farmer. I thought about my granddad who worked on a tobacco farm his whole life. And I thought, I wonder if he would be jealous of the five to ten hours I spend on social media. (laughs) He would not be. Because you know what? When my granddad got done at the end of every day, he was too tired to care. And he was too busy to care. What was he doing? Plotting. Plotting. Plotting the land that God gave him. He was focused on what was in front of him. What if we just plot it with the Word of God the same way? Imagine how things would make more sense to us because we would be seeing and believing what is really true. Imagine how much light others would see in our life if we were given over to the ministry of the Word of God and sharing the gospel and the kingdom. We know that's what we're called to do. We don't have to guess. We are called to follow Jesus. Left foot, right foot, breathe. Imagine the wisdom and patience and hope and reasonableness and happiness we would have if we just took the next step. Left foot, right foot, breathe. 
Maybe plotting isn't so bad. 